you uh, to add ignorance for having me. Uh, I'm the last speaker, so I will try to, to keep it short and to the essential. I was asked to present what we do with uh, a special form of uh, technology, which is a satellite application geospatial technology. Uh, I divided my presentation in two chunks. One is to explain to you what we do in the UN with this technology, what we've been doing since uh, year 2000, actually. And in the second part, I will um, explain how this is um, uh, relevant to uh, what an ignorance is, is trying to do and how what they're trying to do is very relevant to the way we work in the UN. Um, the previous speaker just mentioned that in the same, in keeping with that uh, thought of, you know, citizens being mobilized, citizens being actually less subject of uh, attention and information and being more censored and provider of that information. So basically what I want to talk to you about today is the power of where. Um, we all know the power of where because you, some of you may have gotten here tonight using you know, a, uh, a geospatial application like a simple you know, uh, uh, GPS in the car or on your phone, etc. But the power of where is, uh, is well beyond that uh, and is gaining space and grounds every, every year, actually every month, so that the amount of information that you um, process and you learn through maps is getting larger every year as opposed to the amount of information that you read through and try to memorize. Uh, what is peculiar about satellites is that they've gone from army, defense, intelligence into commercial. The co what's commercial today was unthinkable in a James Bond movie 20 years ago. What exists today was unthinkable only five years ago. Um, a very powerful European country uh, commissioned an intelligence study to know how geospatial would be an asset um, in the year 2012. That intelligence entity failed to guess something like um, OpenStreetMap and Google Maps. And so the report that influenced decisions and allocated millions of euros was actually you know, not accurate. Why? Because they couldn't guess where technology is leading. So what you're looking at was 1960 prime satellite observation system. It was, what you're looking at is, was top secret until 1997 when President Clinton declassified it. What you're looking at is the first operational constellation, black and white, to observe the Soviet bloc key military bases. What you're looking at right now is the same location uh, uh, acquired by Geo I-1, which is a 60 centimeter resolution satellite. You can buy on the website this image anytime you want. A skilled analyst like the ones with, we employed at UNOSAT can tell you which kind of cargo and probably even the, the, the weight on the plane, of the plane, et cetera, et cetera. So you see the big difference. So of course, if you were in intelligence business in the 60s, you would be appalled that this is happening. Now the whole thing is, how do we use this? To continue with the example, this is uh, the same type of satellite. This is the resolution that we have today. Actually, we have better than that. We have 45 to 50 centimeter resolution. I'll show you examples in a minute. Only a few years ago, the same place will look like this because the resolution that was available commercially was 50 meters. What I'm trying to tell you here is that the resolution that we are getting commercially is improving and then we will break the barrier of 25 centimeters in less in the, in the next 22 to three years, maybe less than two years. And that means that you will be able to see things that stay in the pixels of, of basically A4 page with this kind of, uh, with that kind of, uh, of precision. So UNOSAT is an operational program of the United Nations. It's unique. What, it, what we do is uh, satellite analysis. We don't create maps. Maps is a tool to, to share the, the analysis. Analysis means to extract information for what we see through satellites. It could be optical, as you saw uh, in the examples. It could be radar, it could be infrared, near infrared, etc. These are the areas in which we operate and the sub-areas in which we give concrete support, including to the Red Cross and other uh, agencies that are not UN. We don't make a difference in humanitarian affairs and human security between the UN and NGOs.
those. I think that this is a very important message. Um, now, one of the things that I want to talk about is how this technology applied to global issues, which is something we have in common with immigrants, influences the way we take decisions and the way we reduce the margin for um, discussion without action or rhetorical support. Uh, we reduce the margin every day, we reduce the margin of you know, the famous, we didn't know, there was no way we could know that this is happening, etc. The first speaker talked about that with a different technology example, those of mobile phones and interconnection, etc. But this is actually a contingent to that. What you see that up above is, is an image from, taken from space of, um, yeah, of Osh in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, below is an image taken from space of uh, Libya during the latest war. What tells you is that people know that someone is watching. P more precisely, what people know is that some satellite is overpassing that area. As we stay in this building, this building is being imaged probably no less than five times by several different satellites. What we do, we have softwares that tell us where those satellites are. We task them if, if needed. We go and collect these images and we analyze them. The result is what you see behind me. This is an example from Sri Lanka. is an analytical report. It packs the equivalent in information of a report of over 300 pages. What is used, you see on the left-hand side of the, sli of the slide, what is currently used for is this situational awareness, which is basically your where, what, how. Um, decision making, more and more. Situation monitoring, reporting and illustration, which is the first use of satellite technology that was known to the international community, and other, other uses. Now, let me show you examples very rapidly. What we, what's situational awareness? Situational awareness means what is going on somewhere without you going there. This is an example. This is a crossing uh, between Libya and Tunisia. The problem put to us, we couldn't, we, the UN, couldn't go there. There were bullets flying, and the problem was why so many people are leaving and so few people are crossing into the neighboring countries. And so with satellites, we went over these areas, and we actually, what you, you can see there, you can count people. Those little things there, also in the fence, within the fence, there are people. So this was given to the envoy of the Secretary General, the humanitarian envoy to, uh, to, to, to Libya, to give him an evidence of where the people were so that he, he could make the right questions and have the right answers. Uh, another example, rapid mapping. What's rapid mapping? This is Haiti. Now, the previous speaker mentioned that. Um, rapid mapping means issuing maps derived from satellite analysis in the, in the six to 12 hours following a, a large disaster to, to give the sense of what is uh, the situation there. Um, the situation gets known uh, through TV, tweets, etc., etc. Now, this map is much more sophisticated. This map was released by us to humanitarian workers flying to Haiti. It tells you the streets, the roads within, um, uh, within uh, Port-au-Prince that cannot be used. This is vital information, and CNN won't give you this information. So this is tactical operational information that allows you to drive that truck safely from A to B, avoiding going to C, coming all the way back, etc. Things that we have seen in many other uh, humanitarian solution, uh, uh, situations. Another example of impact monitoring, this is, uh, this is the famous, uh, uh, sadly famous, uh, uh, flood uh, in Pakistan. And what you see here is not only the actual extent of the flood, which is uh, it raises a lot of debate during a during, uh, uh, disaster situation. But it has also a dynamic flow. You see the, uh, the arrows here. So it would tell you as a rescuer that these roads there are not usable in 48 hours because the flood is moving there. In some cases, actually, this is quite surprising information because this flood actually was going north to south. But in some places, it was actually going westward which is difficult to understand and to predict if you don't have maps like that. Another example of how you empower decisions, this is 
uh, taken from uh, an operation, operational material duly, during the response to the latest uh, cyclone in the Philippines. And um, what it does, basically, it analyzes the areas that are hit the most by, uh, by, by the cyclone so that rescuers don't waste their time going to places where people are not actually in need. Now, you can make that link, but it will take you days and days and days. And the time of these people trying to do the interagency coordination in the field to send the teams will be distracted from the actual work of, um, of uh, uh, rescuing people. So, uh, talking about monitoring is something that is possible now because of technology. Technology has evolved, and so we have more satellites passing over more frequently, which is the trick. Satellites multiply in space by, you know, uh, uh, a geometrical factor every five years, basically the double. Uh, we know that there will be a limit, but when that limit in space will be reached, we will have at our disposal a technology that is absolutely unprecedented. Just to give you an example, we were helping out our colleagues uh, monitoring the situation in Syria, the, the UN mission to Syria, and we were uh, lucky, we were over them the day they entered this village uh, in July 2012. I won't give you the dates, but basically what you see there on the screen, we were seeing from Geneva through a satellite, commercial satellite, where our colleagues were actually right there in the, in the field. Similarly, uh, talking about the, the Syria uh, um, crisis, what we're doing with using satellites, instead of sending too many people there and putting them at risk, we are monitoring the way refugee camps grow and where they grow. Um, so this is a very simple temporal analysis. You see there is a one color for one week, a color for another week, and so on and so forth. Um, a skilled analyst can also reveal whether the tents are inhabited or not. We had a situation in Yemen, for instance, where we were IDP camps, but no one was there. This is taken from Sri Lanka, the, the conflict in 2009. What we were doing here was also monitoring. What we were monitoring is how the population at risk that got caught between the regular uh, army and, and the tigers was moving in this territory known as no conflict zone. Uh, this job was done, uh, it can be revealed now, but at that time it was quite sensitive, it was done because the humanitarian community, including the Red Cross, was hoping to have an exfiltration maneuver uh, using uh, boats uh, because these people were basically, you know, compressed between bullets and the sea. And this study, could only be possible using satellite technology and identified that bridge that you see behind me as a very dangerous bottleneck. So the bridge will carry less people on the road. Sending those people down that road would have mean making them a very slow, massive target for shelling, which was occurring at that time. So let's come to the second part, working with people. Um, this technology has been up to today a very, you know, uh, sort of elite uh, kind of application because of the analytical skills that are required to interpret this imagery. But any good map is like a sandwich. It comes from, it's a sandwich of data that comes from space and data that comes from the field. Now what is changing very rapidly is that what comes from the field is no longer our colleague or the NGO partner, etc. It's people, anonymous people. So many of you may have heard about crisis mappers, 